sort of a intro song um, to give some worship as people are coming in. Um, so feel free to stand. Um, but before we start that, um, I got a verse from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says this. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And that's a reason to celebrate. That's a reason to give God some worship. So that's what we're going to do. Um, this first song, Shout of Love, um, we are children of God, and so we're going to give him worship for that. Walking the wayside. I was walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. And all the lies I believed in left me crying like. I saw lightning from heaven, and I've never been the same. I'm going to climb the mountain. I'm going to shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of love. I felt the sting of the fire. Just when I thought it was over, you broke me out of the grave. Hallelujah. I'm going to climb the mountain. I'm going to shout about it. I am a child of love. I found the way of freedom. I found the friend of Jesus. I am a child.
sing, you are good. And that's something to be excited about. He is good. Sing, you are good. Lord, you are good in your mercy.
he deserves it. He deserves a praise. Come on. Give him some praise. Hallelujah. Good morning, Montreat. Good morning, Montreat. Give it up for the worship band. Great job, worship band. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the March convocation. We're glad to have you here. Can you believe that the school year is almost three quarters done? Unbelievable. It's like it started yesterday, but it didn't, and you're in the home stretch. So finish well, finish strong. You guys will do great. Uh, would you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer, which I think is coming up on the screen? Please join in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. We have a uh, really special occasion today. This is our annual Calvin Thielman lecture series. We had two really great sessions last night. We've got another session right now happening here in Convo. There'll be a pastor's luncheon following this. Got off to a, gr a great start. Were any of you, raise your hand if you were in attendance last night. Oh, you had a lot of awesome. What would you think? Pretty awesome? Like Caitlin Shess, who I'm going to introduce here in just a second, like she talks about the two things you're never supposed to talk about in polite company, God and politics. Like I love it. It's really awesome, and it's really, really interesting, and for those of you that were not there last night, um, what our speaker brings to us is a deeply biblical worldview, a very deep understanding of Scripture, a, um, a understanding of the biblical worldview as it relates to the political world in which we live. We live in a political world. All things that exist in the world have a political element to them. It's up to us what we do with that political element. It's up to us how we respond to that. It's up to us how we think about that, how we interface with that. And what we heard last night and what I know you're going to hear this morning is wisdom as it relates to how we think and act in a political world as Christians. Um, a little bit of background on Calvin Thielman. That's a name that you may not be very familiar with other than once a year with a Thielman lecture series. Calvin Thielman was born in Texas almost 100 years ago, 1930. And he was on a fast track to a political career when the Lord called him to ministry. He was actually an advisor to Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was the president following John F. Kennedy in the 1960s. Um, it was during the, the Vietnam War. It was a very turbulent time, and uh, the Lord put Calvin Thielman in a place of influence with one of the most influential and powerful people in the world at the time, the President of the United States. Um, he came um, here as pastor of the then Montre Presbyterian Church. Now we know it as the uh, Christ Community Church. Uh, Richard White, we just raise your wave your hand. Richard is the pastor of Christ Community Church. Um, it's a great partner here in the Cove, and Richard and I were classmates at Gordon Conwell Seminary uh, back in the Dark Ages, and so now we're out of the Dark Ages and we're still kind of hanging out together. Um, Calvin Thielman came as pastor of Montreat Presbyterian Church, Christ Community Church, back in 1962 and had a dual appointment as chaplain. We now call that position Dean of Spiritual Formation that Rachel has. But he came as chaplain, and he served in that capacity as both pastor of the church and chaplain of the college for over 30 years, from the early 1960s to the 1990s, and his legacy is a very powerful one. Now let me introduce our speaker. Caitlin Shess is an author, 
uh, writer, and she's working on her PhD at Duke University, at Duke Divinity School, and she's studying this really interesting combination of political theology, ethics, and biblical interpretation. She earned a master's in um, biblical or systematic theology from Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, she did her undergrad at Liberty University where she kind of cut her teeth on the whole question of politics or it kind of cut them for her. Like it, it, it was kind of an in-your-face kind of political moment back in 16 when she was a student there and she can talk about that if she wants to. She's the author of two books and as a young speaker, writer, thinker, that's pretty impressive. Uh, her latest book, uh, which was released last year, is called The Ballot and the Bible, How Scripture Has Been Used and Abused in American Politics and Where We Go From Here. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin Chess. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maurer. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so thankful to be here. This is really fun. Um, and as already has been said, I'm that awful person that's here to talk about politics, um, everyone's least favorite topic. Um, I've actually kind of learned that I need to prepare myself for the fact that when I show up anywhere, people are a little nervous. <laughs> Some of you are nervous because you have correct political opinions, and you're hoping I share your correct political opinions. <laughs> Some of you are nervous because you're friends with those people who have correct political opinions and you're worried that there will be tension. <laughs> we can all take a deep breath. Let's start with just a deep breath together. So I've learned that when it comes to talking about politics, one of the first things that we should do is talk about what we mean by the word politics. I have learned that most of us have something like this in our minds when we think about politics. You vote. Many of us voted yesterday, I did. You think of elected officials, maybe you think of a protest, or maybe you even think of the Supreme Court, decisions that get made at the highest levels of power. This is our image of political life. And political life includes these things, really importantly. But this is the image I want to start out with for us today. This is how I want us to think about what politics is. Community, how we build a flourishing life together. This is even at the root of the word politics, which comes from the Greek word polis, that just means city or community. So right off the bat, before I get into anything else I want to say, I just want to start out by saying when I say the word politics, this is what I mean. How do we build a flourishing life together? How do we have conversations with people who are different from us? How do we build relationships when there's great differences between us? As Dr. Maurer said, I am a uh, PhD student at Duke, and so I'm contractually obligated to quote my advisor every time I speak anywhere. Um, so this is his, Luke Brotherton, his definition of politics. He says it is the forming, norming, and sustaining of common life together. Forming, norming, and sustaining. And I love this definition because each of these three words, I think, means something different. There's the forming of our political life, the laws, the elected officials, we have a certain structure. You probably in high school had a civics class and you learned this is how our government works. But then there's the norming. Why do we grow up believing this is a totally natural, normal way to live a political life? That I get to vote for elected officials, that there are judges that make decisions about things? It's because we have stories that we tell that make sense of our life together. Why does voting seem natural to us even though it was not natural to most Christians throughout history? It's because we grew up in a community that told stories about what kind of creatures humans are and how we can live well in community and what makes sense of our history. What do we inherit? So there's the forming, the norming, and then there's the sustaining. Local relationships, communities, neighborhoods. We need those relationships to sustain our political life. I said last night my best example of the sustaining of political life through relationships is the fact that when I first moved into the house I live in in Durham, North Carolina, I quickly learned that me and my neighbor had a very different idea about what made a flourishing common life. I believed that it involved quiet at three o'clock in the morning. He believed it involved loud music at three o'clock in the morning. So we had to have a conversation about how we build a common life together. I had to go next door and say, hey, this is not how I wanna live. Can you tell me more about how you wanna live and we can talk about it? So politics involves all these things, the forming, the norming, and the sustaining of our common life together. So while we have different obligations, in our lives, to our families, to our churches, to our local, national, state governments, 
our lives cannot be neatly divided into the political and the non-political parts, or for Christians, into the political and the spiritual parts. I want our whole lives, as I talked about last night, to be shaped by scripture, and that includes our political lives. So let's talk about how scripture describes our political life. And we're gonna start at the very beginning, which is a good place to start in Genesis. In Genesis 1, verse 27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image, In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of this whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And for all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So I know you're thinking, I'm very familiar with this story. (laughs) I saw the flannel graph as a kid with the beginning of creation. What does this have to do with our political lives? Well, a lot of our conversations about politics start in a very understandable place. It starts with sin, right? Most of our experience of politics is colored by sin. So we'll say, let's start the conversation with how sin makes it difficult for us to live together in community. I want us to start with this picture of how it was intended to be before sin entered the picture, of human life given the authority to rule and reign, political words, rule and reign over creation, and given a commission to take the good gifts God has given them and make a community out of it. God will say to them, be fruitful and multiply, and that doesn't just mean have children, that means take these things I have given you and build a community with it. And that commission to rule and reign, to use the good gifts of God's creation and make something out of it, is never revoked. It's made much more challenging by sin, but it's never revoked. So I'm going to skip all the sin really quickly and move all the way to the end of the story, to Revelation 21, where it says in verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So political action begins in creation. We're given this commission, never revoked, to rule and reign, to take the good gifts of God's creation and make something beautiful out of it. And the end of the story... There's not a church. There's not just people with God with no organization. There's a city. We don't return to the garden. That commission that was given of taking the garden, the good gifts in the garden, and building something good, something flourishing with it, is fulfilled perfectly in the New Jerusalem. A picture of a city is not just a picture of a good thing. It's a picture of human community, organized well, which requires politics. So this is the picture from the very beginning to the very end. And I skipped some really important things. (laughs) What makes it so challenging, right? That's a beautiful picture of political life. It would be so lovely if we were just free to fulfill this commission and it was never challenging. None of us have that experience. But here's what's importantly true. Even once sin enters the picture, that commission is reiterated. The first conversation that God has with Abraham in Genesis 12 says, I will make you into a great nation, I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The very beginning of the people of God is a people oriented outwards towards the life of the world a people oriented towards fulfilling this commission of taking the good gifts of God's creation and doing something with it. It even says in Isaiah 60 that the kings will bring the wealth of the nations into the new Jerusalem. So all of these kings, not people of God necessarily, but people who have done good work in the world, had moments of reconciliation, of justice, of creativity, of goodness, that goodness doesn't just go away, it is brought into eternity. So this, this picture of political life, of the people of God oriented outward, seeking the good of their communities, is not the picture of political life most of us are familiar with. 
We don't actually see as many people as we would like, working with joy to seek justice and show mercy. We don't think of our political life as a form of worship very often. Usually this is something more like our experience. Some feelings might be arising within you. <laughs> This is our experience of political life, not this beautiful picture in scripture of seeking the good of our communities, of fulfilling this commission, of being a people of God oriented towards the life of the world. Our experience of politics is usually angry social media fights, Thanksgiving table blow-ups, trying to figure out who to vote for when there are no good options, wanting to see common sense, good policies passed, but instead watching politicians fight for the best zinger on cable news. Scrolling Instagram or TikTok and just seeing angry people post takedowns of even angrier people and feeling your own blood pressure rise and you can't do anything about it. And while we might expect that from a fallen world, why on earth are we seeing that among the people of God? Strangely enough, actually, this kind of picture of political life is not too far from how scripture describes it as well, including by God's people. So finally going to the very middle of this book, I'll take you to Isaiah 1. It says in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now I should start out saying, Isaiah's not actually talking to Sodom and Gomorrah. He's talking to Israel. He's just insulting them really badly. <laughs> He's calling them the worst name he can think of. You are like Sodom and Gomorrah, the worst kind of people. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Now, if I was the people of God hearing this word from Isaiah, I would have an answer to this question, who asked this of you? You did. You asked this of us. You asked for the sacrifices. You asked for the festivals. What could possibly be wrong here? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. And this is what should really give us some caution. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. When our spiritual formation practices, the sacrifices and festivals for Israel, but the sacraments, worship services for us, when our spiritual formation practices go unexamined, we end up participating in rituals that are detestable, and a burden to God. Good practices, as we'll see in other places of scripture, lead us in the direction of seeking justice, defending the oppressed, goals that are unavoidably political goals, right? If we've started out thinking of politics as how we build a common life together, this is Isaiah saying, you are doing it wrong. Do it right. In this passage, there might be the most common perversion for God's people, to expect our religious devotion to excuse our injustice. To think that our private devotional practices mean we don't really have to engage in any of the messy political questions of the world we're in. But Isaiah over and over again rebukes God's people for fasting and thinking that he will notice their devotion while they spend their fast days exploiting other people, fighting with each other. This is what he says later in Isaiah 58. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high? Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, he says in verse 6, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide shelter for the poor wanderer when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? These are sobering words from the prophet. As it was said in Isaiah 1, I'm, I'm not hearing your prayers. Here in Isaiah 58, it says, you cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Importantly, these passages in Isaiah don't substitute spiritual formation for work of justice. 
Isaiah is not saying stop worshiping God, stop doing these things God is saying, just pay attention to the needs of the vulnerable, don't do any of that other stuff that God told you to do. He's saying pay attention to how your idolatry is causing injustice. Isaiah is highlighting, as many of the other prophets do, that injustice and idolatry go hand in hand. We mistreat people because we are worshiping wrongly. And here's why. Worshiping idols will always ask more of you than you can give them, and you have to exploit other people to get them what they want. If you worship money, you'll end up exploiting other people to get it. If you worship success, you'll end up trampling over other people to get it. If you worship popularity, you'll end up diminishing or degrading other people to get it. Suddenly, humans made in the image of God are obstacles to the worship of the idol that has you captive. So politics is necessary because it's not separate from our spiritual lives. If idolatry and injustice are so intimately tied together, we have to pay attention to both. We have to ask how we are worshiping wrongly and ask how that's affecting our neighbors made in the image of God. So, if from Genesis to Revelation, politics is necessary. If from Genesis to Revelation, politics is a way that we fulfill this commission, and yet, in the middle of the picture, in the middle of this story, it is incredibly difficult to do it well. There are idols vying for our attention. There are traps that tempt us to treat other people made in the image of God as degraded. And our political life is no different from Isaiah's. This is the picture that shapes most of our political life. Politicians and pundits alike know that fallen humans are susceptible to idolatry, that we crave powerful stories about the world and our place in it, so we can fall for really dangerously false ones. That's why when we talk about what is so broken about our political lives, when we think about why Christians in particular have failed to live up to our best theology about politics, I like to talk about false gospels. When my first book came out in 2020, there were a lot of pastors that would ask me to come and just kind of like fix their church. <laughs> they would be like, things are very bad. People are fighting a lot. Could you just come in and like say the perfect thing that would fix it all? And it turns out that's not possible, <laughs> especially over Zoom. And here's what I think it really misses. Here's what we miss most often, actually, in our political theology. We are not usually engaging from our ideas, from our theology. We all share this book, right? So if the story I just told you, Genesis to Revelation, is true, we all have this book, why do we fail so terribly at it? We're actually engaging in politics from a deeper place than we're conscious of, from the place of stories and emotions and identities. One of the things I think I, we have all learned over the last few years is that people cannot be fed a steady diet of cable news, Facebook posts, political advertisements, TV shows, movies, and not have that affect their spiritual lives. We can't keep letting that fester and grow as if it will not affect us spiritually and theologically. There are just some things about humans that politics has understood better than the church very often. Emotion is at the heart of our political life, whether we like it or not. We are pulled through the world by our emotions. They're not bad things. They give us valuable information, but they can also be exploited by the media and by politicians. Because our conversations about politics, our conversations that can get very heated, you might have noticed, aren't usually heated because people get really intensely passionate about tax rates or where to build a new bridge. Usually it's because there's something deeper going on, some deeper story belief about who they are and what's most true about the world that is shaping our political life because we are storytelling people. We run and live off of stories and we run and live off of loyalty. Loyalty is a combination of our identity and our sense of community, who I am and who I belong to. So these are the tools of our political life. These are the tools shaping us, telling us what to believe, who to hate, what to love, how to act. Fear desire, love, hate. These stories and loyalties are communicated to us primarily through emotion and storytelling. I'll give you one example of this. Dr. Maurer already mentioned I went to Liberty University when I was a college student, and we had a lot of chapel speakers. We had to go to chapel three times a week, so lucky you. Um, we had to go three times a week, and very often during the lead-up to the 2016 election, our speakers would be politicians. 
And one year, Bernie Sanders came <laughs> to speak. Sort of a strange choice. Uh, the, the school had to keep their tax exempt status, so they had to invite anyone who wanted to come <laughs> who was running for president. And Bernie Sanders, to his credit, showed up. And he said, look, we disagree about a lot of politics. But you're Christians, and you care about helping the poor, and I care about helping the poor, too. Can we just talk about that? And I, I was really impressed by that. And I looked around the giant auditorium. There's so many students at Liberty. And most of what I saw was this. Absolutely not. I know what to think of you, and I don't like it. And that made sense to me, because people have pretty strong political feelings. This was not a school that was going to be particularly hospitable to this guy. But a few weeks later, something interesting happened. Another speaker came, a woman named Ann Voskamp. If you know her, she's not a politician. <laughs> she writes devotional books. She's a speaker. She doesn't really talk about politics at all. But she spoke from the stage about the story of Esther. And she said, we have to pour our lives out for the vulnerable. We have to risk what we have for the sake of people on the other side of the wall in Esther's story. And I was moved. And I looked around and I saw this. Absolutely not. What was going on there? Many of us had been consuming media that we thought was just telling us how to vote. Here are the politicians that share our view of the market and how important the market is. Here are the politicians that are the socialists that are bad. But underneath all of the policies and the politicians and how to vote and who to vote for was a story. A story about the world that said, if you're poor, it's your fault. And if you're wealthy, you've done something to deserve it. And that story was more powerful than telling us who to vote for or what policies to support. That story told us what to believe, how to treat our neighbors, and what stories from scripture we could hear. It was a powerful story. It's just one example, but this is the kind of frame I want us to think in when it comes to our political lives. What are the stories I am being sold? And do they line up with scripture? When I was a kid, my mom, who's a very wise woman, used to tell us right before Christmas a certain thing about all the commercials we would see, right? Right before Christmas, you start getting way more toy commercials, so all the kids can find all the toys they should put on their Christmas list. What my mom would always say is, find the lie. She would say, there's a part of this commercial that's not telling you the whole truth. When I was a little kid, I really wanted this Barbie that could bake cookies. And because my mom had said, find the lie, I remember the day I was sitting in front of the TV and I went, that Barbie can't bake cookies. <laughs> she has a little apron, she has a little bowl, but I will have to stir the cookies together and put them in an oven. She doesn't do it for me. Because she had taught me, find the lie. I think that is the real mission for us in an election year. Find the place that we are tempted to believe something not true about the world. Find the place where maybe the policy or the politician that's being supported, maybe it's a good goal. Maybe it's a good thing. But the story underneath it is false. Maybe I still vote for the politician. Maybe I still support the policy. But I've had the discernment to see underneath it and say, what story about the world is being told here? And is it true? Does it line up with scripture? Ultimately, all of the stories we consume need to be weighed against the most true, the most perfect story that there is. And that story doesn't end with violence or dysfunction or pain. It doesn't end with the politician we really love winning and saving us from everything. It doesn't end with the really scary visions that we have been given. This is not the end of the story. The most true story does not end with this destruction or violence. The most true story ends with these words that come right after the word that we already read from Revelation. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. During this challenging election season, let's make that the focus of our political life. That before anything else, before any policy we support, before any politician that we're tempted to give our allegiance to is this ultimate truth, Christ will return to make all things new. We don't have the weight of the world on our shoulders. The way that you voted yesterday, the way that you'll vote in the election in November, it can be a good act of faithfulness. It can say something true. It can contribute to the flourishing of your community, but you are not saving anyone, which is a real freedom, I think. A real gift. So let's keep this focus.
Christ is returning to make everything new. And every story we are tempted to believe must be judged against this ultimate true story. I'm going to pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the gift of it to us in a challenging year. Thank you for the way it confronts every lie we are tempted to believe. Give us the discernment we need to see what we might not. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hmm. Amen to that. I think mean, a little more appreciation, please. Jesus is making all things new. That is a good word. That is a word we need to hear. Um, all right, friends, just a few announcements for you uh, before we wrap up. First of all, Coda Music Festival. A uh, shout out to the music business people. Where are you at? Uh, so March 23rd, Saturday, it's going to be in front of Gaither Commons uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, tickets are free to students. They're discounted for staff. Uh, David Wilcox and Ashes and Arrows are going to be the artists that are, who are featured. And this is a really, really great production that we do every year. So you're going to want to be sure to prioritize that and be present for it. Uh, pastors and ministry leaders... Uh, right after convocation, we are going to be hosting a special training session for you with Caitlin. Uh, so this is particularly for pastors and ministry leaders who are trying to lead congregations and communities through this really challenging season. Uh, we hope and trust that will be a real gift for you. So that's going to be in Gaither Fellowship Hall. A lot of y'all know where that is. If you don't, start walking up the hill and find a student to shepherd you where you need to go. Uh, you, will, you will find it, I promise. Uh, and so we do have a meal for you. Uh, we'll get we'll start serving food around 11, and the program will officially start at 11:30. So we're looking forward to spending that time with you. Uh, and let me just pray for us one more time because it's an election year, and we need all the prayer we can get. And you're in midterm, so you need it even more. Uh, all right, thank you, Lord, for this good word and this good promise that you are making all things new. May we be a people who reflect that hope who reflect your priorities, and will you do a new thing in us and through us. Uh, we pray over this country in this election season. We pray that your kingdom comes in a new way, uh, in, a, in the way of Jesus and not in the way of the world. And, Lord, I pray over all these students as they are preparing for exams and taking tests, God, would you just uh, fill them up with the energy and the focus that they need to finish this week well and give them good Sabbath rest over the break. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. All right, let me bless you and send you. Stand up. Right. Mm -hmm. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace. Now, through the rest of midterms week and forevermore, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great rest of your week. Have a great spring break. We'll see you later.